The Unconventional Therapist's Guide to Nothing. Hey everybody, welcome to The Unconventional Therapist. My name is Dave, I'm here with my co-host Greg. Today is a glorious day because Greg, frankly, we're here together talking like we do once a week. Yeah, but something feels a little different. Like something's in the air, Dave. Like, and what is what is that something? Dust. Love. I have not, not dusted in a while. Love is in the air. Oh, that too. And dust. Yeah, it's February, midish February. So of course it's Valentine's Day. And we usually we usually get we're we remain aware of the holidays, don't we? We're cognizant as they pass by. Oh, always. Yeah. And I think that, well, let me say this. People usually have different preferences on how they receive love, right? And now we know, and you well know, Dave, since you've been digging in this thing for a little while now, that there's a book where you can discover some insight on how to better understand the person you're in a relationship with. And that sounds great on paper. That sounds great on its face. But I think the book we're going to talk about today has some holes in it. And you know, just like most self-help books, in my opinion, I've um, I've always kind of had a hard time with self-help books. They always have like these big, jarring, like I'm going to fix this thing. Like I specifically the book, the subtle art of not giving. Um, yeah, fuck. yeah, that, I'm going to say that word. And I read that, and I still give a fuck very much. So it's like, I I don't know self-help. The secret. I've read that too. Didn't really get much out of you that. Could have, so, you could have just said an F. I was going to say an F, but it is, it's I mean, that is literally the title. Oh, it's F with the, the marks. We'll ask, yeah, you could have said F and then at apostrophe um, exclamation point. Yeah. 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 Because I, I agree. Like, I, I usually think that we're a little bit of an elevated podcast and the swearing takes away from it. But we, look, yeah, it, we don't need to just throw swears in to get the kids that's, listening. That's, that's, you know, this one's not for the kids. All right. There could be some stuff in this one. This actually so, could be for kids. And I'll well, get to it, that later. It could be for kids, which I think is problematic in its own right. But all right, we've been talking, we've been beating around the bush, so to speak, um, about a book. And Dave, why don't you tell us what it is since you really i mean i am so proud of the work you've been putting in on this <laughs> all right so the book we are going to discuss today is called the five love languages and this is by a man called gary chapman and i'm going to i am going to go ahead and say as with most things greg and i are way behind the pop <laughs> culture curve when it comes to this stuff um this book 30 is years. not the new at all <laughs> it's not new whatsoever uh, it's probably been referenced like love languages. I feel like within the past, I'm going to go on a limb and say like five years. I've heard people referencing love languages quite a bit. Yeah. The point where my most recent exposure to it was I watch a show called Love Island and I'm not embarrassed to say that. And on that show, <laughs> I don't care. I, I love every second of it. And on that show, they referenced love languages way too much in fact the one character in this uh, character one person particularly his name was bergy he was a very like unassuming uh favorite on the show he talked about his love languages all the time so i was like you know what they keep talking about love languages i mean they're saying all this other like cool lingo that like if we could just add to this podcast maybe we would get some more lessons right. um but i'm like there must be something to this well, Dave, why is everyone talking about love languages? Let's ta- let's let's be let's be men and watch Vanderpump instead of Passion Island or whatever the hell you're watching. I do watch day. Vanderpump Rules. Okay, First cool, of all, good. I've been watching Vanderpump Rules for way before you. I know you got me into it. You just started with the Scandaval stuff. Tom Sandoval, that scoundrel. <laughs> you don't even right. know about no, the here- history of everybody else cheating on each other. Never mind Tom. So y- you hit on something there that I think that everyone's kind of getting. And maybe we're getting ahead of ourselves here, but like, isn't that like missing the point when you're talking about that guy saying, these are my love languages. Isn't the point to not know your love language, but to try to find the love language of your partner? Well, that's why he was saying it. He was asking theirs and then he's talking about his. And 
actually the more that like i learned about this he was kind of doing it appropriately because the show okay. is you literally get matched up with people or you pick people you want to pair up with and you try to make it work within a 24 like within a day suddenly mm -hmm. they're going to get married and like they're uh, they're living on euphoria until the next person walks into the island and they're like oh i want that person actually <laughs> yeah. and then they leave uh so but like he was going up to people with genuine intentions and he was trying to get to know them and this was a thing he kept talking about. So I was like, what is it about these love languages that makes people feel like this is so important that I'm going to bring it up as soon as I meet this new love interest that I have? So we'll get there. Um, but let me give a, just a, like a brief overview of who Gary Chapman is. Uh, okay. Because he is the founder of the love languages. He is the man that put this together. So Gary Chapman, he's an author and radio talk show host. And he was born in 1938. I think he's 80 something i can't remember exactly but he was born in china grove uh north carolina he reportedly had a happy childhood which uh comprised of studying work play in church which is exactly what i would expect gary chapman well, it's, 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 uh, it's, 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 it's a puritan childhood yeah. <laughs> yes mama <laughs> um he claimed that he learned valuable lessons by observing his parents so i mean in many ways this guy is very privileged like he he had a nice childhood. He explained it's happy. Um, his parents sounded like they were pretty responsible parents. They gave the children structure, clear expectations. He had like regular bedtimes, which he felt like is an important thing to like point out in his bio. Uh, and it just taught him crucial life skills from what he felt like was very early on. Um, so all good. One childhood experience, though, that was impactful for him. And, you know, maybe this just influenced how, how he sees the world or how he sees like, people working through things. He saw his grandfather battling with alcohol and um, witnessing a seri uh, serious motorbike accident caused by drugs, which really influenced him to stay away from those things and to kind of take on this belief that a healthy brain is a great asset in life. So he, I, I always say there's like two ways you can go after you have experiences with other, like witnessing people struggling with drug and alcohol abuse. Or the same with like any kind of abuse. You either decide I'm going to do the exact opposite of those things because those go, the, my values now set, tell me I don't want to do those things. Or sometimes people end up repeating those patterns and finding themselves in the same patterns. He decided he's going as far away from it as possible. At 17, he starts getting committed to serving Christ. He begins an educational journey. Um, he goes to all these different like Bible institutes and ministries and all this stuff. Um, but while he's doing that, he also starts taking some counseling courses uh, within that as well, which is obviously going to serve him well in the work he does later. He marries his wife, Carolyn, who he has been married to for over 60 years, and she edits all of his books. Um, their relationship started as volatile, and they had to really learn about how to make things work and understanding what they, under what they ended up developing as love languages so dave something you touched on there i'm wondering if people who are using this um you know my love language is you know um a sopranos marathon and a large iced coffee whatever it is right people use this term all the time and they really put some credence into the idea of love, love languages but do you think that it would change anyone's opinions to know that this is almost like it's got a real religious bend to it and it's almost like an evangelical so type thing it does, but it doesn't. So I don't know. Like, that's his background, but this can easily be taken. Like, just because something is is created by a person who has a set of beliefs, mm -hmm. does that mean that you can't extract that, that development and make it fit into other contexts just because well, it has the context of it? It's actually a super interesting question. Maybe even, like, its own episode, because... I remember reading the Canterbury Tales in high school and the partner's tale was, he was like this guy who was a really bad guy, but he was going to tell you a moral story. So it's like this idea, can can you take advice from someone whose values you, you disagree with? And I think, yeah, right? Like, can we get, it's almost like that argument, can you enjoy R. Kelly's music or can you appreciate Michael Jackson's music despite, um, you know? I'm like the biggest fan of R. Kelly's music that you can ever meet. Do I, do I agree with his actions? No, oh, you yeah, don't. Th thanks for reminding me. So, yes. Yeah, so back to we don't want to talk about his love language, right? No, we don't. It has a 
a tint to it. <laughs> yeah. um, so Gary uh, dreamed of working abroad to train national leaders, specifically in Nigeria for some reason. But that dream didn't come to fruition because uh, he was rejected by the International Board of Southern Baptist Convention due to his wife's health, health for some reason. Um, so then he decided to work as a professor for several years um, at what is now uh, Carolina University. And he was a pastor at Salem Baptist Church. Flash forward, he joins Calgary Baptist Church in Winston-Salem, North Carolina in 1971, which is where he's been ever since. Um, and he gets involved in like sharing responsibilities of teaching and family care. So this is when he, I believe when he first starts dealing with like couples and things like that. And he has some inspirational stories that came out of this where he really started to kind of utilize what he learned in his own marriage, what he saw in his parents' marriage, in the stories that he was hearing from the couples and develop the five love languages, which argue that while all the languages um, are enjoyed to some degree by all, a person will usually speak one primary language. Um, he then also argues that all five are um, can be individually ranked by an individual. So we'll get to those in a second, but just about the five love languages, the first book um, that he promotes is called The Five Love Languages, How to Express Heartfelt Commitment to Your Mate. And that's published in 1992. And it's sold over 20 million copies in English, and it's been translated into 50 other languages and is consistently still in the top five books on the New York Times bestseller list, claiming number one spot at some time. So like, and I don't know how recent, you know, that, that information right there is, but that's crazy. Let me ask you a crazy question. Yeah. Do you think it's, you would rather take the advice from someone who has this a long lasting, one long lasting marriage, or would you rather take the relationship advice from someone with like, you know, who's had some troubled marriage, maybe some failed relationships, like these kinds of things. Like I, no, I and it sounds like a stupid question, but I'm being no, serious. It, it's not a stupid question, but, and I don't, I think like where you're leading me to is maybe I would want to like talk to someone who's had a, a multiple, you know, either marriages or relationships because they would know like what's worked, what doesn't work, but what does give me some confidence in his story is his recognition that his relationship was not always perfect. Mm -hmm. And I, I actually really appreciate that, that that's like the first thing he says about his marriage is it was volatile. So that gives you an impression that like, obviously there were some things that weren't working that he had to figure out. And, you know, his, he and his wife, they have two children and he claims that he learned tons of lessons and struggles from um, parenting during the parenting process. And those have translated into some of his other books because he's done these love language books for single men, for military, for parenting, um, for everything. So God. for God. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, he's, he's found ways to make this love languages thing applicable to anything. And I think you'll figure out why when you all hear this. So starting off with the five love languages, um, Greg will go into those. Okay. So Dave, you want to start with um, words of yeah. affirmation? Oh, well, before that, let me just, there's a quick little thing I wanted to uh, discuss, which will kind of apply to all these love languages. Okay. First off is this idea of two stages of romantic love. So there's the in love experience. That's when you meet someone, he describes it as euphoria because you're just like, head over heels, everything feels so right, it's intense, you're, you're just feeling the love, you'll do whatever for that person in, in that time. It's just, it's the height of the relationship. And unfortunately, as we all know, that's not going to last forever. But like a lot of times people will get married during that in love experience, right? And that right there is kind of a setup for failure, right? <laughs> because once that in love experience fades, which, which it's going to at some point in time, you get into the other part of the love phase, which is kind of like that um, maintenance, I guess you would say, the, the part where you actually have to work and try to learn each other and figure out like, you, it's, it's just all about intention and learning how to communicate romantic love and keeping that going, which is going to take effort versus the euphoric stage where it feels effortless. It's effortless. Right? Dave, now, which, what, what do you suppose, which stage are we in? Um, the, the intentional 
Okay. Learn to communicate romantic love stage. You, you know, I do. I, I love that he kind of mentions both these because I did identify with this too. And it is this thing where I think the love that lasts is that love where you're, you both have the same goal for each other. You're both kind of looking ahead at the same place. If you both want to make it work, it's possible. It's just going to take effort. And I think effort's the key word there. But yeah. you really, ha- I think that's the most important thing with relationships. You have to have the same, like, destination right sure yeah where, where you're kind of both looking out there the same thing like i know it's going to be because it's just like when we talked about with your own personal life if, if you have a destination then things can happen obstacles yeah. can happen things can happen I mean, to you, right? that destination could just be like i want us to remain a somewhat caring and happy couple right yeah. it doesn't oh, even yeah, have easy. to be like this huge crazy thing it could just be like i want this to work i and want us to stay together to- and you have to figure out how you're going to do that. Mm-hmm. And, it, you know, one of the measures is by keeping a full love tank. Oh, yeah. So he uses the word love tank. That's not a lie. He actually uses this term. So what, why he uses this term is you want to keep your love tank full. And you want to recognize when it's full. And when it's empty, that means you need to feel love. And you may seek love when your love tank's empty. And the problem a lot of people have is if we don't understand our love, each other's love languages, we don't know how to fill each other's love tank. Yeah. So you're over here putting in diesel and I need ultra 93, right? Yeah. I mean, that's the thing you need to understand. And I think that's the, the a takeaway that makes sense with this is understanding, you know, what, what the, uh, that your partner responds to. And I think that's important. And we'll talk about you know, as we go through these, we'll see that, yeah, these, I don't know, they're kind of on the nose, but and understanding the love language, but then making intentional um, efforts to give that to that person. So I could mm-hmm. know someone's love language, but if I'm not paying attention to them, if I'm not putting in that effort to make it a point to show them that love language on a consistent basis, they're walking around with an empty love tank. I know. And who needs that? that and then they might, be lo- they might be Here's the thing. Now they're looking for some, maybe someone else can fill it. Well, they're getting that tank filled. So one way or another. Right. So that's that's what you want to watch out for. Not the, and I don't know. But anyways, I think we should get into them. Let's get into this yes. thing. All right. So here's the first one. Words of affirmation. He, Gary Chapman quotes Mark Twain in, for saying this quote. I can live two two months. I can live for two months on a good compliment. I botched that one. I think that's a great quote. I can live for two months on a good compliment. What does that highlight? The importance of making someone feel good. Right. So if you are someone who likes to hear verbal praise or verbal something, verbal niceties, that is going to be something that's going to fill your love tank and is going to give you that energy and feel that love that's going to keep you invested. So types of affirmations. These could be verbal compliments, you know? You look nice today. Greg, that's a sick hat, dude. Thank you. Greg, that mustache is on fleek. That means a lot. I'm sure Mark Twain probably got that same compliment. It means <laughs> Those are a lot. two things I could say exactly to Mark Twain <laughs> and to Greg. Yeah. Wow, that is awesome. Um, so that's those are a type of uh, af- verbal affirmations. And then there's also words of encouragement. So words that address the latent potential within their areas of insecurity. I took that right from Gary Chapman. So yeah. it's like, Greg, let's say you're writing a short story. And you took that from uh, Freud, but go ahead, yeah. <laughs> you're, you're writing a short story, right? Yeah. And it's like, oh, I'm struggling. Um, make, Greg, you know, you always put in so much work in writing your short stories, and they always are so on point. Um, I feel such like excitement when you ask me to read your your short stories when they're finished and i just can't wait for this next one to be done i know i know you're struggling trying to get it out right now but like when it's done i know it's going to be a banger Mm. how do you feel that that feels honestly and i'm not even kidding i feel like you really saw me because you you did something (laughs) you but and i'm not even kidding because that's like something that i do care about and i have i've been struggling to work on lately and i appreciate that dave thank you yeah yeah no problem dave so what does when that just about, tell you? You just told me that, like, actually, uh, words of affirmation are maybe one of your love languages because the way you just responded to both of those things. I know. So I was going to hope that we got to that in the end, but we yeah, will. I we think, will. Yeah. No, it's okay. It's okay because I, I, I think that you're probably right. Should I do one? Should I try one? Yeah. So you, so words of affirmation. That's that's the first one, Greg. Next one. 
physical touch. Mm. Okay. So there's some obvious things here. A feeling love through touch. And this isn't just sexual experiences, right? I mean, this could be cuddling, laying next to your partner, maybe doing a little foot rub. I don't know. It can, you know, because here's the thing. And I'm going to be honest, when, when it comes to my own work in couples, which has kind of picked up a, a little bit lately, which yeah. I, I don't I don't appreciate. Um, but it's what funny. I've noticed, honestly, time after time after time, it really can get into this whole, it's it's often a lot about sex. There's a lot of sex stuff going on. Um, Lack thereof. Be, uh, well, yeah. One so partner that, wants it too much. So here's the thing that I've noticed a lot. So maybe... In, in a few specific situations, the couple's getting older. Maybe the man's body isn't responding the way it used to, right? So instead of like having that difficult conversation, because as a man, that's a difficult conversation to have. It's very uncomfortable. He might start, he might start fights and cause difficulty in the relationship so that he can avoid, a, you know, a sexual situation. Because if he's too nice to her, now he's going to put himself in a situation where there might be a, an attempt at sex and that's going to cause all this shame and embarrassment and she's going to think it's about her. So to avoid all that, he kind of creates this distance between them. And now they're they're fighting and their relationship's tearing down and they're both not even sure why that is, right? Mm. So understanding that physical touch can go beyond that and slowly getting back into that. And also I think what these things are really at the, at the base level teaching us is you got to communicate. Because to understand the other person's love language, you kind of uh, got to ask some questions. You got to be curious about what's going to make them happy. And you start to understand these things. So physical touch is a big one. And, and it's not – so sex is important. Let's just be honest. It is. But there's other things that kind of go along with physical touch that are just as important. And sometimes you put so much emphasis on the sex that you avoid these other – like maybe a little touch on the arm or a touch on the shoulder and because in fear of – you know, having to get engaged in this, it's it's actually, you can get into the weeds in this stuff, but physical touch is, plays a huge role yeah. in relationships. They, I mean, he makes reference to even like, you know, ruffling someone's hair, like your partner's <laughs> hair, like a small, a significantly smaller touch than, you know, what people probably assume we're talking about here. You know, another really interesting concept here, though, is just because that's your love language does not mean you can assume that that's going to be your partner's love language or that they even like it. Mm. So, uh, for example, physical touch is a, is a great example. I actually have this person, um, that I counsel that her partner keeps doing some like physical touch stuff, but it's like very to her feels almost like violating. Like he, he'll like stick his tongue in her ear okay. or like, or like bite on her a little bit. Yeah. Clearly wanting her to do it back. Yeah. She doesn't like it at all. And she has made that very like clear that she does not like it when he does it to her. So that doesn't like make her want to do it back to him. So rather than have like a clear communication, there's just this like behavior of him trying to initiate it by doing it to her, her telling, getting upset. And then it just fizzles out whatever yeah, so that moment could have been. Yeah, they're not speaking the same language. And here, what about this idea? Do you think, all right, so say his uh, love language is clearly different than hers. And that doesn't mean that either one of their love languages is wrong. Exactly. But is there just a time where, okay, we're not speaking, the, like we're not speaking the same language here. Maybe we don't, maybe we're incompatible. I think we're right? getting ahead of ourselves here because uh, okay. that's definitely I, a question I had for you. Yeah, maybe down the line, right? So- yeah, I, I, because I, I think even in one of these vignettes, and I don't hope like that. Um, we're not getting ahead of ourselves there, but does isn't there a kind of a scenario like that that he kind of offers up the suggestion, and his suggestion just off the rails? In my opinion, do you um, know the one I'm talking about? We get, yeah, we we'll get, get a lot ahead of ourselves. Yeah. All right. All right. All right. So the next one is a big one: quality time or QT so, or QT. These are periods of undivided attention. Uh, I've, here's a quote from Gary Chapman himself. Togetherness has to do with focused attention. It is giving someone your undivided attention. As humans, we have a fundamental desire to connect with others. We may be in the presence of people all day long, but we do not always feel connected. I think that he's really driving home what quality time is about here. It is not about just being in the same room as someone. It's intentional. It's 
making eye contact. It's not like, hey, we're sitting here, but you're distracted on your phone and I'm sitting here watching this movie. It's like, no, we're doing something together. So he actually highlights a few ways that you can make this happen. And, you know, he does suggest that you, if this is someone's love language, you make it a point to try to do this for like 15 and 20 minutes a day. Um, simp- so the first example of quality time could be quality conversation. This is sympathetic dialogue where two individuals are sharing thoughts, feelings, experiences, and desires in friendly, interrupted context. Um, so basically what he's acting, he, asking for you to do here, if you are going to do this with someone, is focus more on what you're hearing versus what we are saying as in affirmations. So like, ask questions. Active listening is something I talk a lot about at, at my at my job uh, working with individuals with disabilities. Because so many times, like they'll be talking and they don't feel like anyone's hearing them. So not just talking over them or um, offering guidance. This is this is a big issue in relationships. One partner will vent mm-hmm. or tell the problems, and then the other partner feels like it's their job to solve the problems or offer solutions, but that's not what they want. And then they get frustrated and it leads to arguing. Sometimes okay, so just, you're not always, it's not always about solutions. Sometimes it's just about support. Exactly. So it's not just giving advice. It's giving sympathy, understanding, attention, and just listening. Um, so some tips to quality time, maintain eye contact. Don't do something else while listening. Um, listen for feeling. So what emotion are they feeling and try to like identify that. Observe body language and refuse to interrupt. And then another thing you can do on your end while you're having this conversation, it's not just, you're not just sitting there a mute. Also do uh, self-revelation. So that's tell your thoughts and your feelings, which is different than just voicing your thoughts. It's saying like, if they ask your opinion or if you're talking about something that happened, you might say, that made me angry. This is what, you know, I'm going to do about it or something. Rather than just saying, I'm going to do this or that. It's like acknowledge what your emotion you're feeling too. And that's so vulnerability. Is, it's that's an important that's an important one because that's the one where you might learn the other love languages. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. And you know, for some people, this I mean, this all sounds like that one sounds kind of intense almost because there's like so much direction behind something that feels like it should be easy. And maybe it is easier for some people. He's just providing a lot of context because I think it would be really easy to be like, but I do spend quality time. We sit together and watch, you know, King of Queens uh, reruns every night or something like that. But it's like, are you really spending quality time though? Just if you're both just zoned out watching something, you know, and here's the some people, maybe I'm guilty of that. Like, and, and I almost feel like it is my love language that that exact scenario would be somebody else's love language. You know what I mean? Like where it is like, Hey, I, to me, zoning out, watching a show and just kind of like knowing maybe just a, maybe just like resting a hand on a leg or something like And that's just enough to be like, we're spending quality time together. Maybe your and quality time isn't the qual. Maybe your love language isn't the quality time. It's the physical touch that goes along with it. Ooh. And if she says something sweet to me, forget it. <laughs> All done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I like that. I like that a lot, actually. So um, quality time, a big one. Yeah. What about for me? Want me to do gifts? Yes. All yeah. right. So receiving gifts. Now, I'm more of a gift giver. But receiving gifts symbolizes love, care, attention. Because it's not just the gift. It's when you get someone the right gift, it's the effort and the time that they put into it, right? So that's really that really can shine through with a lot of gifts. And I've actually, I know this isn't, I enjoy giving gifts. but I'm not, I'm not that great at it. Like I remember past gifts, especially around Valentine's day. I once got a girlfriend, a Valentine's gift and it was bamboo. And I know you would appreciate it because you're very, you're a plant guy. You love this, but it was beautiful. Like a few beautiful shoots of bamboo with a nice little gravel and everything. And I heard her call her mother. And she said that he got me sticks for Valentine's day. (laughs) Now that's, you know, I I mean, you know, that's just certainly, to me, that's putting a lot of pressure on the gift giver. I think if the effort and the thoughts there and you really think that it's something that – so here's another example for me of I may have in that situation, I should have said, okay, this person and I aren't compatible because our love languages are just so far off, right? Like, I mean, 
you know, I, I just I, I think that I've been in that situation a lot. And does, does that make any sense? Like yeah. if if you're if you're really trying to do something nice and then they don't appreciate it anyway, like I what is that? So yeah. so he would actually, I think in that in the gifts thing, he would actually argue it's not about the thought. It is about the um the time of what what was it? What is it? what he says about this? It's more about like the meaning of it in relation to like how like what it does for the person or like how it relates to the person so if they if but in the book it was very domestic it was like it would be like the opposite of what you're supposed to do. It'd be like buying someone a vacuum or something and that might just because of the because of the i don't know he's got this sort of doesn't he have this sort of 1950s kind of vibe about him where For sure there's he, definitely something along the lines of like very old school gender mentality. role kind of thing yeah yeah well i mean he does argue that though uh later so i don't know i know that you know he wrote this in 92 pleasantville all that stuff like yeah oh yeah <laughs> absolutely so, so I, anyway, I, I think, think we're that... still fighting some old school values at that time but I, I do think like obviously some updating to some of those vignettes uh, is needed and like i i honestly don't updated. know what they are updated so yeah yeah just continue to update them they need to a couple more yeah updates for <laughs> sure <laughs> all right so so you, i mean yeah you don't want to just get a gift to get a gift you want to get something that actually has some meaning and you know really speaks to that meaning mm -hmm. the last one is acts of service so we're already at number five the act of doing something as an expression of love. So the best way to put this is a couple meets, the woman, you know, notices that during that euphoric stage, like her partner, just like he gives an example of this couple that he's talking to and the partner is constantly like helping her with her schoolwork, um, which she finds to be special and makes her feel loved because he's, you know, helping her with something that she's struggling with. When they get married and the love, you know, the euphoric stage fades and they're just in their relationship, she gets very uh, upset and feel, stops feeling love because he now stops doing that because he feels like we're married. Now we should fall into our roles. And in his, his household growing up, you know, he always saw that the wife cooks and cleans and that's her expression of love towards the dad. So he noticed his wife wasn't doing that. He wasn't doing the thing he was doing in the beginning of the relationship. And it turns out they both um, had the love language of acts of service, but neither of them was engaging in it. So what Gary Chapman advises them to do is to do those things for each other, <laughs> which is it's like a simple solution. But yeah. like when he can, they made a list of like what would be things that the other partner could do that would show expressions of love and they made lists and they compared them and they said is this accomplishable and they both agreed to do it and that had a, a positive impact because they were both seeing the acts of service play out and it was feel they were both feeling loved mm. so it could be doing things for the other person this is again my my i'm as you're saying i'm like these this is my problem with self-help books a lot of it's I, like no shit it well yeah yeah but Greg, it's no, but here's the, when here's... we're telling people to count the, you know, the seconds as they're inhaling and exhaling, we're doing deep breathing techniques for, uh, for anxiety, yeah. but we know it works. It's different. <laughs> and, yeah. I'll tell you, I mean, I'll tell you something. Breathe else. in and out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's sometimes things are very obvious without being obvious. The thing that makes this not obvious is the couple is not communicating because they don't understand why this is happening or why it's so impactful on the other person. They do other things that they think they're supposed to do. So communication that, is key. That's what we're talking about here. But you also have to, like, I wouldn't just know to communicate. Like, it's this is my love language. Mm. This is why you not doing this means you don't love me. It that would be a really a hard thing. It would be a really hard thing for me to figure that out and also communicate that in a way that didn't make me sound like a misogynistic pig, right? Mm -hmm. Which yeah. one reviewer already thinks I am. So the, everybody else out there, you know. Um, but yeah, like that, how would you know to be able to like say, say that and actually have it land? 
All right, well, what about this? Doesn't it feel to you that this is very like horoscopy where you could, and what I mean by that is you could look at all of them and be like, oh yeah, this, they, they all apply to me. Like this is kind so of what, all me. And you know, that's, I think that's something that criticisms are starting to point out is like, he says everybody has one primary. Yeah. And then there, I've, I've heard complaints from people that like, well, I feel like maybe I like two of these or two of these feel equal to me. I don't know. What, do you, what was your thoughts about that too? Um, do you think that everybody just has a primary and then the rest are like rankable? Or do you think that there, there could be existence of like two things being just as meaningful? Yeah, no, absolutely. I think there could be, I think you could be needing all of these. I, I think it's just, these are just all components of a relationship separated into five categories. Right. I mean, they're all but part of a relationship. Think about, yes. But then what he's arguing, because he says that right, uh, right in the front, it's that there's primary ones, though. And I, yeah, I, I, do, can, I can buy that. I, I, I do buy that. A little I bit. I do buy that. Yeah. Because there are things yeah. on there like gifts. I'm a bad gift giver. And I also don't like getting gifts. Take gifts off the equation. That's ranked number five for me. Acts of service. I appreciate it. I think I like the idea of them. But again, to me, it's kind of like gifts. When people do things for me, I feel a sense of guilt and like that I have mm -hmm. obligation, right? So that one's probably like four. The other three, I think, are probably higher on my list. So it's funny, like, and for me, I would say quality time and words of, and words of affirmation are important to me. Because you, when you were saying that, like quality time, maybe that's not important to me. It's just, no, it's just, it's got to be my idea of quality time. Yeah. Which is fair, right? Yeah, like, I absolutely. think that's that's very important to me. Um, what, someone wanting to be interested in what I'm interested in, even if just for a little while, like maybe listen to a damn episode of the podcast if if you could, right? Like that kind of thing. I, I think that's that's that kind of stuff's important to me. And what what would you consider that, right? Like acts someone of service. taking an interest in okay. acts of service, maybe, right? Like yeah, doing something to as an expression of love. So when someone doesn't want to listen to your podcast because they find it boring. And they don't like listening to your opinion about things. Well, maybe we're just not compatible. <laughs> <laughs> but they do it anyway. And then now we're now that's we're love. Now, now that's love, right? They're filling your they, love tank, Greg. But if they don't, though, I mean, I don't know. So now you're making me question <laughs> everything. So, so it, the the first thing you said though was the horoscope thing. And that I think it's kind of intentional. Like he obviously picked five things, but good on him for picking five things that are very relatable. For everybody. He says, though, he makes a bold statement. I read that there is, I don't, I don't know if he said this or just this was like an article that I stumbled on and they're claiming this is like is more related to him than it is. But they're, sta they're stating there is no sixth love language. So like he picked the five, he found the five, like apparently. There's an eighth deadly sin. There's a sixth love language. All right. <laughs> you don't get to make claims on that stuff. Yeah. And, and if you're wondering what, if you're wondering what that is, check back in the archives in the Seven Deadly Sins episode, right? Yeah, yeah. it's a trailer. All right, so yeah, I guess that would be a question. Like, is this the end all, be all of love, love languages? Is there could there be more? Is there is it true that there can only be one primary and the rest are all rankable? I don't know. Is there questions? I don't know it does have some holes in it though. Um, what about this idea that it operates under the assumption that all relationships can survive? Yeah. And that, that probably I was that one. I was like a, something I definitely wanted to discuss because, right. Because, you know, and I think that's probably because of the religious nature of that. It. 100%. Like, so he, you know, he starts off his book talking about divorce and how easily people give up because, <laughs> you know, in this day and age, and he doesn't even say that. It's like in this day and age, as soon as you leave the euphoric stage and you no longer feel love, people give up and then they divorce. And where in previous times, it was more like you worked on it or you stuck together no matter what and you just didn't but divorce. But that's the problem. That's a huge problem. That's what that's that's what caused a lot of these dangerous relationships because the the fact that leaving the relationship is on the table keeps you within the guidelines of like respect. It kind of makes you act a certain way it keeps you trying yeah. if you know that no matter what you do yeah you got to work on your love languages a little bit but no matter what you do it's you're always going to be together 
I don't think that makes the best relationship for people. I actually would challenge you and say, I think both are problematic. So I think staying like this idea that you just stay together just to stay together because you shouldn't divorce. Yeah. I think that's a problem because that can lead to a lot of issues. But I also think people rushing into marriage, like th- he's he's not misguided to say that there is um, this early feeling you get in a relationship that eventually is going to fade into the reality of the what the relationship is. And I think that's when re- people really get to know each other. And you start to see all the little things, the quirkiness of each other, and you start to understand each other better. Um, during that euphoric stage, you really are always trying to show that person your best side. You're really like, hey, look at this flaw I have. Or <laughs> yeah, I'm a real yeah. lazy piece of shit. Look at me. Um, I guess I, I guess I do understand both sides. But that's – but I just – and and look, I'm kind of a more – I'm a romantic. I'm more of a, like an old soul when it comes to the relationships. I think that it's important to try everything. Um, you, I want to be able to walk away from a relationship and be able with to say. With a souvenir kid? Yeah, with my sticks. And I want to be able to say, hey, look, I gave it everything I got. Right? Yeah. I mean, but sometimes sometimes you just, you're just not a match. And that's okay, too. Yeah. Like, how that, about that? That's that, a topic he he doesn't really drive home in the end, which feels I guess for a lot of people listening to this that don't have that religious connection that he that he's coming from, it probably leaves them feeling a little bit like, wait a minute, I got all the way here. And now you're actually like not even going to touch on the fact that like maybe two people just aren't compatible. Now, does that mean is this guided or aimed at married couples specifically? It feels like. All right. On the surface, if you're just reading it for what it is, surface level, absolutely. Everything Mm -hmm. you reference is is talking about married couples. Do I think that the intention is that only married couples could use this? No, I do not. Okay. All right. What do you think? I think that because is Gary Chapman's wife his first girlfriend ever? Yes. Then he has no clue. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. (laughs) Right. But that's (laughs) the thing. That's the thing though, right? Like, so if, if not, so he's put himself in a little bit of a bind here though, because if, if he married his first ever girlfriend, then he really doesn't have, it's almost like a priest giving you advice on your relationship being like, dude, you have no idea what you're talking about. Or if he did have a couple failed relationships before his wife, then he has to leave room for the option that, yeah, sometimes the best move is leaving the relationship because, you know, you both deserve the right to find the right person for you yeah so here's where i think we can we can look at this for what it is okay we can extract whatever gary's message specifically Mm -hmm. might be and you make your own message when i read this or when i when i was going through all this my take home was the thing that feels the most important is if a relationship is not working you start to open communication up with your partner figure out why we fe- are feeling the way we're feeling. Or if it's just one-sided, why am I feeling the way I'm feeling? What is not being um, provided that I need in this relationship? So what he does point out is a lot of times criticisms of from the partner who's unhappy are the most loud in the area that they have the deepest emotional need for. Mm-hmm. So like, there's this example of this wife that's complaining about her husband going hunting all the time. It's not that she cares about him hunting. It's the hunting takes him away from other things that he she would rather he be doing that would make her feel loved. And for her, it was like that was I think that was one of the ones that was like acts of service. So like there were things that he was neglecting to do around the house because he was out fishing or hunting. And that was causing her a lot of frustration. And then in return, she was doing her spiteful behavior because she was feeling like he wasn't doing his responsibilities. And then it just turns into a whirlwind. So it's about identifying what of my needs are not being met and communicating that with your partner to at least give it a chance. If it feels like you want to work on the relationship, if you don't want to work on the relationship, you can't force it. Right. That's right. This is a book for couples with very conservative gender roles who want to make it work. And you don't even have to put, you don't have to frame it with the super conservative gender roles. But what I'm saying is this is a, if you, this book can be useful to you. If you are, you both want to make it work and you genuinely like, that's what you want. 
But I mean, this isn't something that's gonna. If one person's on the fence, or you know, th- you that's what we get most of the time in uh, couples therapy. That's what's so difficult. You get people who are like on the fence, like one's on the fence and one really wants to be in it, and it's like that's not really. Yeah, but you know, Greg. Here's the thing, though. In couples therapy, you're probably in a better place than just when you're just meeting with a one of the people from the couple, because just for them to take the step to be there actually speaks a lot louder than anything at all. Yeah. They would not just show up if they have zero intention to try to like work on something. They probably are just doubtful that it is able to be worked on, which is what he talks often about is trying to help people understand we can work on this. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. You know, the gender role thing, he actually does like address... So, and I don't know what makes him address it. So it's interesting to like, he addresses it almost in a way that makes it seem like he's kind of unaware of how much he's still leaning into the gender roles. Um, So he actually explains that like previously um, gender roles were modeled are used to be modeled just by our parents because we had like limited outside influence. But then with the expansion of like media access, um, we got to see like other types of relationships and, uh, different values in relationships. So we're expo- we were exposed to broader gender roles. Not that the gender roles don't necessarily exist, but just that more more that people have like expanded and included a wider wider variety of tasks or behaviors that might be included. So like men doing domestic stuff, I guess, mm. was kind of that was kind of his explanation because he was talking about acts of service and he's like you think I want to take out the trash? (laughs) Like, or in like, do you think I want to vacuum? He's like, no, I don't want to vacuum, but like, I might be expected to vacuum because that's a act of service that my, my partner might require of me or want from me. And I'm, if I love them, I'm going to want to do that. So he was trying to like, almost make it feel like acceptable for men to feel like it's okay to do domestic chores. Yeah. So he's still kind of under that mindset that like, that's where he's at. I don't do, I don't vacuum. It's very, like, if you want to, like, it's very sitcom, like, men just fumbling around, right? Yeah. And, and the women are taking care of, I don't know, that's the kind of What do you that, know about North Carolina? Like, in, like, that area, of, like, Win- uh, Salem, Winston-Salem area of North Carolina. Very conservative, right? Very conservative. So, I so, mean, I'm assuming that some of these um, gender roles that he's expressing are probably... Yeah, and what year was he born? 1938. Okay, so that's what we're talking about. Yeah. So yeah, I, I, that's just, and that's the same reason why one of like a huge critique, obviously, is that there's no gay couples in this, no same sex couples. So I, I'm not a, I'm not against having a book that's for, you know, that's just like for straight couples. That's like for their to help them or whatever. But I don't know. It's, it's. I, I was trying to like grappling with this. Like, does that make him a bad person? The fact that he's like not okay. Like, it's back to that question that we were saying in the beginning. Like, can we still take advice from this person, even though he has such antiquated voice? Like, can you get good advice from a, not from a bad person? I don't know. I want to say, and he's not a bad person, but like, I I really do think that people knowing that it has this evangelical conservative Christian bend to it, and that's sort of its genesis. I think that would change their opinion of how they, how often they use the term love languages. I really do. And I don't know if that's right or not. And it's interesting because, like, he's done the tours, right? It's value. There's value in this. There's value. In he was on Oprah. Okay. And you know, he he does podcasts. He does tons of interviews. So clearly, there's an audience for this man's message. Mm-hmm. And I think that it's it's valid. Like, I was listening to a lot of this, thinking, I like a lot light bulbs were going off. I was like, this is stuff I've never really put in too much thought into, and I definitely could see how this stuff impacts relationships and how relationships could be improved if this dialogue started to open up more. But you're right. Like there's a quote from him uh, from a, something in like 2013 saying like, talking about the disappointment a parent would feel when their child is indicated that he or she is gay. Yeah, and that's, that's no good. Like, men and women are made for each other. It's God's design. Anything outside of that is outside of the primary design of God. So like, yeah, not great stuff there from Mr. Chapman. Um, but I think that 
we can still extract from his work. Oh, without... that's like saying that's honestly, and if we're being completely honest, that's like saying my I can't get any good advice from my dad because he has antiquated beliefs. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's just not true. Two things can be true at the same time. It, he was born in the 30s. His how do we know what we know? We've talked about that, right? This it's yeah. it's not coming from a dark place. I mean, even there's another there was a little story in here with a, uh, there was a woman and she was in an abusive relationship and his answer was to sort of try more physical touch. Yeah. And even though it made her feel kind of used and gross and he uses Bible quotes to inspire her. So there is some, there's some dark in here and there's some light in here. And I think like the idea is to, you can't just turn the back on all like things just because there's some darkness in them, because that's like turning your back on people, right? In general, because we all have some darkness in us. We all have some, we're all looking at the world in a different kind of way, but that doesn't mean that we all don't have something to offer that we all can learn from each other. So I think that's, that's what I'm kind of getting from this book. Yeah. Dave, now, do you want to hear something that maybe like I sort of my new approach to counseling as I've been doing it? Sure. And I want to, I kind of want to get what you think about this. So this is my first step. This is what I've been doing. And this is actually what I've been using with someone that you referred to me. And this is the, this is, I call it, this is who I am. So, so this is what I, what you do. Like you create this sort of profile as if you're making, um, I don't know if you're on the apps or something, right. And you make the list and you say, this is who I am. And this is where I can bend. Right. And, and like, meaning like, these are the things about me that I'm willing to kind of change a little bit if I have to. And this is why I'm willing to do that for you. And then there's the other list of this is who I am and this is where I can not bend. This is these are my values that I can't that are unshakable. And I want you to respect that about me. And because sometimes in relationships, like people want things from each other that kind of go against their values. Like maybe they they're um a blended family and one's kind of being a little off to one of their kids, and it's like you know, they kind of allow it, but then it, it, it causes this really d dark thing. So I think if you have this sort of almost like contract where this is where I'm willing to bend and this, this is where this is almost a deal breaker for me. And then you can kind of look at those together and decide, hey, what are we doing here? Like, are we going to keep watering a dead plant like Gary Chapman would have us do? Or are we going to say like, maybe it's time we part our ways like Greg Sharp Deer would have us do? Not that I'm the breakup artist, but I'm just saying like, I don't want people to waste their time either. Yeah. So <clears throat> that, I mean, that approach is great because you just give, you're giving like a framework for someone to kind of utilize. And you know what I'm talking about, right? Things. Like I wanted to find a way to kind of have him be okay with, you know, being proud of his values and saying this, I love you, but I don't want to bend on my values. Yeah. 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 So, so, so I, you... I have an, I have another big question for you. Okay. Yeah. So you asked an important question about Gary Chapman's beliefs. Sure. Another pretty big criticism about this work uh, offers another question. Can we utilize this, especially in something like professional, like therapy? Can we utilize something that's not based on empirical data and say that it's effective? Like there's no actual research backing the love languages from my understanding. There's no, no there's, empirical there's data. No. There's no, nothing saying like, this is, you know, like, to, all right. So to, you know, for listeners who aren't aware, like a lot of the things we'll utilize are backed in research. They're backed in like data. There's like, or scientifically proven to work. Like we were talking about the breathing exercise. Like this, th this doesn't have that. So it's something that we're saying we're connecting to well, as we're researching it. We're, we're like, oh, I like that theme. Can it still be used? Thousand percent. Yeah. First of all, totally so. like psychoanalysis isn't tied in, is in empirical evidence. And most importantly, more than anything, what's probably least, least likely to be able to ever have any empirical evidence to support it is existential type of therapy. Like and we've talked about this idea of, Dave, are you going to go into my car and get me my wallet because it's on fire? And you say, no, because that's crazy. Dave, will you go into my car? Your mother's in it. You're going to find any way you can because you you found that there's like the reason why is big enough. So I think that in a relationship, if you can find the reason why you love each other, then that's going to that supersedes all scientific 
data, right? It's like, why do we want to make this work? If you can both, if you can help people understand why, then the rest is easy. Yeah. So I, I think sometimes with, with in the matters of love, science, you know, maybe science doesn't fit in that. And maybe that's why there's always been this sort of, um, you know, butting of heads of, you know, spirituality and science, because they kind of, it's tough to get them in the same room sometimes, but that doesn't mean that either of them aren't equally important. Yeah. And I just in general, I just think that if you can connect to something and you can make it make sense in the framework of the work that you're doing with an individual, then, you know, if it's not harmful, as long as it's not harmful to the individual, y- utilize it. I've found myself already referencing this like nonstop in any session that's been, you know, about a significant other or something like that relationship stuff. Here's the crazy thing. I actually am finding like this themes, the themes from this to actually be applicable to all relationships. Oh, Co- coworkers, uh, parenting, uh, anything like the work I do with individuals with disabilities. Like when I'm thinking about like them trying to get their needs met and how they're like, like we do. All right. So typically it's, it's framed as, positive reinforcement. What am I really trying to identify when I'm looking to see what kind of positive reinforcement do they like? I'm trying to see what their their love language is in a yep. way, right? I'm trying to figure out what actually has impact on that individual, and motivates them to want to do better or to maintain, you know, whatever it is that we're trying to have them maintain behaviorally. So, I think it actually applies to everything. If I'm talking about a coworker or I'm talking about an employee, I want to find a way that find feedback that speaks to them not something that's going to like not mean anything to them. And like, they're just going to brush off. Like I could say, Hey, good job. But if they don't care about words of affirmation, that's going to mean nothing. This too, Dave, how about this? You know, when's the last time someone made, made you feel really good, like made you, made you feel really loved or said something to you that just was like really kind. Like you remember that. And not only that you love them back for it. You know what I'm saying? Like there's something there where it's like someone really kind of touches you. And I don't mean that in the physical touch way, or maybe I do whatever, all of it. Um, You know, that's something that, so finding, taking the time and and really understanding and finding what, what, you know, is going to make someone happy and make them feel loved is a little bit of a different approach to when relationships get a little bit old and you're, and you're not even purposely, but you're trying to find out what's going to make them jealous or what's going to get a reaction out of them. It's, it's a whole different approach to it. Where it's like, what's going to make this person feel really good? Yeah. How often, and I think that's the, like the great message of the whole thing. How often are we truly doing that? Well, like this person treated, they made me feel this way. So you're not, you're not going to, the first instinct isn't going to be like, how do I make them feel loved? So like maybe this changes a little bit and they can, they can feel comfortable and, and that this can be beneficial to both of us. We're not really doing that a whole lot. Absolutely. And I know that like, even in my relationship, it's kind of made me do some like soul searching too. That now that you mention it. That's so why I did, that's why we did this, Greg. Cause it's V day for you. You did it for me. 100%. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so th- this probably speaks uh, very loudly. Uh, previously at my job, I used to keep a folder. Like we could make our own folders in the email system. And I would put any email that had positive feedback I had received in that folder. What kind of love language do you think I have? You're, you're a words boy. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It, That's okay. Yeah, it's super easy. Dave, you've been a valuable asset and friend to me. And I've I've sought and appreciated your insight with patience and into my own life. And I think that just meeting you has put my life on a trajectory that I don't know if it ever would have reached without you. Thank and that's you, the truth. And you know that, right? I mean, we spend Christmases together now. Yeah, yeah. We t- we talk more than anybody uh, in my in my life. I mean, at least we're like. Throughout the week, we're thinking about the same things for sure. It's an interesting uh, thing, Thought, right? Right, yeah. <laughs> like, I don't, I don't ever say, weird way I wonder to what say Dave's it, thinking. Like, it's funny. What's Dave thinking about right now? I know what he's thinking about. Yeah, yeah. Think about Gary Chapman. <laughs> uh, Greg, did you have any more, like, questions or takeaways that you wanted to cover first? No, you know, there was so much to say, but I think that we've kind of, 
you know, maybe, the, maybe we've said enough. Okay. Um, really quick, speaking of words of affirmation, I uh, just wanted to go on to just highlight a review we got this week that was really meaningful. And as soon as we got it, we messaged each other. And I, the first thing I said, it was like, how validating was that? Um, so this was a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts. Uh, it says, relatable, funny, and insightful. This is from All Zalty. Uh, one of the best psychology podcasts out there. The diversity of the topics is pretty wild, covering everything from disorders to true crime and historical figures. There's something here for everyone. Uh, one episode per week doesn't seem like a lot, but when you think about, uh, but when they get into the details, you realize that they must have spent so much time doing research on one topic. Blows my mind that they have enough time to do this on top of being full time therapists. That was like right there. That one hit me like super, super validating because that's the thing we talk about all the time. Like life is busy. Uh, yeah. We, yeah therapists but also a ton of other things as well um and like yeah we really enjoy making this podcast and making the time to do this so i'm glad just to hear somebody kind of acknowledge that and appreciate it that's awesome so thank you so much for that review um i swear we're not just only highlighting the positive reviews it's just that's how they're coming in they've been so damn good lately so we appreciate and they everything. mean everything we don't need you know I mean, if you really had to support us, I'm sure you could Google us and get to our Buzzsprout page and click support. And that'd be great. But um, other than that, just listen and leave reviews. Oh, and a, another Brandon. big shout out to Brandon Cloud for actually subscribing to our subscribers page, uh, which Greg just mentioned is part of our Buzzsprout um, support the podcast page. Links in our bio on Instagram, or you could just Google it. But Brandon Cloud, you're the man. Thank you so much for subscribing. We really appreciate you. We're hoping we're going to have some stuff we can send your way at some point. Um, we don't have it yet, but we'll we'll develop it pretty soon. And uh, yeah, like, what are your thoughts on handwritten cards? That'd be that'd be pretty good, mm, right? We make them ourselves. You can write the message, and I will create a doodle, which will probably be Bart or Homer Simpson or a Wu Tang symbol. Okay, all right. And we will send that your way. No spoiler. I won't tell you which one it will be. <laughs> and um, class photos from ninth grade. I like enough. that. I can get my hands on that. Uh, what else? What else can we throw into this mix? <laughs> Me um, at the California Raisins ice capades. Yes. 1987 and five years old. one of those do you do you actually have one of those like actual Cal california raisins with like the bendable legs no oh i used to have them i don't have them anymore i, I know them. wouldn't it be nice wouldn't it be nice yeah all right, all right dave well this was this is it this is a wrap thank you everyone so much enjoy your valentine's day um remember it's a commercial holiday but it still can be enjoyed by the masses and even if you're single who cares? Enjoy it. Treat yourself. Nobody can love you like you can love you. I That's think true. Quote and Greg gives a smirk. So yeah. he, appro he approves. I agree. But yeah, I, I, I told myself that because I used to be like, oh, commercial holiday. It's all, you know, whatever. Who cares? Just mm -hmm. freaking live life and enjoy things. Are you going to have a holiday. traditional Valentine's Day breakfast? <laughs> I don't have a tradition. Why did I never think of that? I don't know. Just chocolate covered fruits and mm. no, my, yeah, my big I traditional breakfast is coming up in, in March. So yeah, it's coming up. I'm excited up for quick. you. All right, everybody. So thank you so much. Um, as always, if you like what you hear or you want to leave some feedback, Apple Podcasts has a great place to leave a review and a rating, but you can also leave ratings on Spotify or any other uh, streaming platform. As we mentioned, there's a subscription page to support the podcast. Uh, links in our Instagram bio. And if you are on Instagram, you might as well give us a follow. Hit us up. Let us know that you exist. And uh, we will surely repl reply. Or we're also on X. And that's about it. So we will see you all next week. We got a little true crime for you next week. I know some people have been asking for that. So your uh, wishes are command. We will see you then. They lovely lovers. 
birds. I like that. Yeah.